Hello, my dear students, and welcome to officially our first lecture dealing with the optical fiber communications. Today, in this lecture, we are going together to investigate the formulation, the fabrication, the theory beyond the optical fibers. As we mentioned in the, in the zero lecture, optical fiber is considered as the main guided medium for optical communication. It has a huge advantages with respect to RF guided communications. And this is maybe one of our important points to consider in this lecture, to address the difference between using a guided RF signal and a guided optical signal. Let's start our lecture. Okay, so first of all, in order to address the full theoretical background of this lecture, lecture, sorry, you can access either the optical fiber communication principles and practice for uh, senior in uh, John, John Senior. Uh, I believe this is available over the internet. And also we have another reference, which is optical system communications. Of course, you have also the lecture PowerPoints and the lecture scripts on, over the e-learning in addition to the recording of this lecture. Okay, so this is a full um, transmitter receiver block diagram for an optical communication system. As we mentioned, this is actually a copy paste lecture, a copy paste slide from lecture number zero, where we have the optical modulation block using laser as an optical carrier. As we mentioned, we have a receiver or demodulator on the other side, and in between we have a transmission medium. This trans transmission medium should be or can be an unguided air medium. However, in this case, you have to guarantee the line of sight, or the other solution is to use an optical fiber guided medium. But maybe one of the questions with no answer in lecture number zero was, what is the advantage of using optical communication over the RF standard communication? We are already using RF everywhere in our mobile networks and all this stuff. Why should we should shift to optical fiber? Why the base transceiver stations or the public central telephone networks starts to change the infrastructure from using the standard coaxial cables to an optical fiber cables? The answer is simply here. What you are doing when you are shifting from the RF or the microwave region to the optical region is that simply you increase the frequency of the carrier because as you already know, the frequency of the optical signal is much higher than the frequency for the RF and the microwave signal. So this is the main advantage, or this is the main difference, let me say, this is the main difference between the uh, optical signal and the microwave and the RF signal. Okay, so what happened when we increase the carrier frequency of the carry uh, when, when we increase the frequency of the carrier signal what will happen the impact here my dear students, the impact is in the bandwidth as you can understand the bandwidth is logically a function in the carrier frequency for example when you have a carrier frequency equals to one gigahertz it doesn't make sense to have a bandwidth equal to one gigahertz this is, the, this is against logic. Your bandwidth may be hundreds or tens of megas. So it's a relatively a ratio between the carrier frequency and the bandwidth. Whenever you transfer to this terahertz carrier frequency, I mean the region for an optical, either in, infrared, visible, or ultraviolet, then you can expect a major increase in the bandwidth of your signal. So. Whenever we shift to an optical signal, we should increase an four order of magnitude or 10 power four increase in the available bandwidth. And this is simply answer the question why we should shift to optical 
communication whenever it's applicable to have an optical communication. This is the answer. Of course, any customers need higher bandwidth because simply higher bandwidth means higher internet speed, higher downloading speed, higher uploading speed, higher, higher transmission speed, higher uh, also streaming speed. So this is basically the impact. Okay, so whenever we go to optical communications or optical fibers, we have numerous bandwidths. We have small size and weight. The weight for an optical fiber is uh, lighter than that of the coaxial cable and also another big advantage which is no cross talk no interference this is one of the main issues related to the standard rf and microwave technology if you remember your uh, last semester module so this is mainly the main advantages of the optical fiber now let's turn to the technical part optical fibers are a medium where we expect light to move in. In order to understand this concept, which is actually the task of the next part of this lecture, I just need to recall some basic optical uh, laws or formulas you already have seen in your preparatory year, maybe in your high school, related to the light reflection, refraction, and all this stuff. Okay. Uh, though, let's now turn to our white paper. Okay, here, I think this is our white paper. And let's now stop sharing for a while. Okay, perfect. So let's start recalling or refreshing some important information. One of these important information is snail's law. Snail said, when you have two mediums, for every medium of these two medium, we have what's called refractive index. This refractive index is abbreviated by N. To link this refractive index with your background study in microwave and antenna is N is equal to the root of epsilon R, where epsilon R is the relative permittivity of the medium. Of course, as you know, epsilon R is a frequency dependent parameter. So when I mean epsilon R in optical communication, I mean here you are substituting by lambda or F in the optical range, of course. So you are not, of course, if you go to your epsilon r in the RF, uh, in the RF uh, frequency and put it here in this equation, you will not, you will get a wrong n because it's not in the corresponding frequency range. So this is the refractive index. So as you know, any medium has its own relative permittivity. Accordingly, any medium will has or will have, sorry its own refractive index. So whenever we have two mediums, we will have two refractive indexes, N1 and N2. Once the light is propagating from one medium to another, then we have what's called the angle of incident, let's call it theta one, and the angle of refraction, which what's called theta two. What snails told us is N1 sine C to Y is equals to N2 sine C to 2. This is snails do. So you can link between the refractive index and the angle of incident. The refractive index, of course, for both mediums and the angle of incident and the angle of refraction by this relation. Also, one of the relations you can you should remember is the reflection one. So whenever we have a light here, this light reflected here, so the angle of incident 
equals to the angle of reflection. And there is a very important tool here, what's called the critical angle. What is a critical angle? Of course, theoretically, whenever you have a, a medium here and you have a light propagating from this side, for example, you have definitely two proper, uh, two, uh, proper uh, properties. Oh, sorry, two probabilities. I'm sorry, two probabilities. The first probability is that some of these light will be transmitted to the other medium. As I mentioned, CT1, CT2, all this stuff is non zero. The second probability simply is that some, some of this light will be reflected back to the same first medium, the medium on the left hand side. So, is there a condition at which all this light will be reflected? No light will be transmitted? Yes. This is what we call the critical condition. These critical conditions happen, or what's called theta critical, happen when sine theta critical is equals to, let's say that this is called n1 and this is called n2. So when sine theta critical is equals to n2 over n1. Whenever you have the angle of incident equal to this critical angle, all the incident light will be reflected back and no light will be transmitted. And this is what's called the critical angle or the critical condition. This is just a very um, brief description or refreshing to your previous knowledge in uh, the light propagation signals. Let's start to use this information in order to understand how optical fiber operates. Okay, perfect. Let's return back to our presentation slides. And let's start our point. Okay, so generally our optical fiber is consisting of two materials. What we call a core material, which is from the, its name, it's the core, it's the, the middle material. And what we call the cladding material, which is the covering material on both on the top on, and on the bottom. Of course, optical fiber are, are, are a coaxial cylindrical, and this is a cross section for the cylinder. So these are two center cylinders. This is the, the core is the inner of cylinder and the cladding is the outer cylinder. Okay, again, let's remember the main concept of the optical fiber. Uh, optical fiber is an guided medium where we should expect light to propagate inside. So generally speaking, if you consider that your transmitter is in the left side and your receiver is in the right side, then you should expect or you aim to transmit light from the left side here to the right side here through this medium. I mean, in the other words, you should act to avoid any light transmission to the cladding and light should be trapped inside the clay is a core material. The word trapped is very important. You are trapping the light inside the core material. That's typically your aim. Accordingly, you are going to use the critical condition. I mean, you target that all the light reaching this boundary should be reflected back to the core material and no light should propagate to the cladding. So here we have a total internal reflection as far as we have a, a critical angle. So here is theta, uh, sorry, phi C, where C of course stands for critical, sine phi C should be equal to ref the refractive of the cladding, which is N2, over the refractive of the core, which is N1. This is typically the condition. Of course, realistically, you will always have losses. However, 
what you are going to do by using this in, uh, total internal reflection condition is that you are minimizing this losses. Okay, now, what about the entrance angle? As I mentioned in my previous example, we should assume that, for example, our source is located in the left-hand side of this optical fiber. So the source will be inserted. I mean, the light of the source will be inserted somehow into the optical fiber. This is what's called the entrance angle. But how we should make some condition to this entrance angle to make sure that here, a total internal reflection will occur. Because for some example, like you can see this arrow, if the entrance angle is not well adjusted, it can result with a very bad scenario, as you can see here, where light transfer from the, from the core material to the cladding material and total internal reflection doesn't occur. So we have to tune, we have to adjust the entrance angle to ensure, to guarantee a total internal reflection in the core cladding interface. So geometry wise, how can we manage this? Let's start to do it together. Okay, perfect. Let's make zoom in sketch for this condition. So this is our optical fiber. Of course, this is N1, which is the core. This is N2, which is a clade. And this is the interface with the uh, source. You have some incident light like this with some angle, let's call it, for example, theta one. Then using snail's law, of course, this is air, or let's assume that this is air to make life easy. As you know, air, epsilon r is equal to one, so n is equal to one by default here, n equal one. This light incident, so this light will be somehow refracted with another angle, let's call it theta two. And then at this point, my dear student, you are seeking for total internal refraction. So this angle is, should be phi C. Is this right? So let me do it again. Let me zoom in this area. So you have this triangle. This is a 90 degree angle, sorry. This is a, a 90 degree angle. This angle called theta two, which is this one. And this angle called phi C, which is a critical angle, should be the critical angle. Okay, perfect. So from this triangle, which is this one, you can say that theta two, plus phi C should be equals to 90. Or in other words, phi C equals to 90 minus theta two. Okay, perfect. Then, can we link theta one with theta two? Of course we can. This is Snell's law. So the refractive index of the first medium, which is air, so one, times sine the angle of incident, which is sine theta one, should be equals to then the entrance medium, which is N one, times sine the angle of refraction, which is theta two. So sine theta one equals to N1 sine theta two, as you can see in this graph. Okay, let me use a more clean paper. Okay, 
So what we reached, reached up till now, that sine theta one, which is the incident angle equals to N one, which is the refractive index of the core sine theta two. And theta two equals to 90 minus phi. This condition is a basic condition. So sine theta one equals to N one sine 90 minus phi. Or of course, sine, sine 90 minus phi, which is cosine. So sine theta one equals to N one cosine phi. This is simple. Okay. So how we can ensure a total internal reflection when this phi becomes to be phi C, a critical angle. And how this happen when sine phi C is equals to N2 over N1. If sine phi C is equals to N2 minus N1, then cosine phi C will be equals to root one minus N2 over N1 whole square. One minus cosine, uh, one minus sine square theta. Cosine theta equal one minus sine square theta. So by direct substitution, you will get sine theta, which we will call it A, I mean the acceptance angle is equals to N1 times root one minus N2 over N1 all square or sine theta acceptance is equals to root N1 square minus N2 square. And we will call this the acceptance angle or what we call the numerical aperture of an optical fiber. Back to our slides. Okay, so as you can see here, this acceptance angle is equals to, or the numerical aperture is equals to n1 square minus n2 square and root, which is typically the same we have reached. From this equation, my dear students, or from this equation also, you can reach a very, very important conclusion. This is actually one of the usual standard interview questions whenever you are applying for an optical communication, optical fiber or networking job. What should be the relation between the refractive index of a cladding and the refractive index of a core optical fiber? You know that sine angle or the sign of any angle should results with a number gray is smaller than or equals to one that's basically mean that the cladding refractive index which is n2 should be always smaller than n1 again this appears here because you have an under, you have an under root equation so so to get a real answer you should have n1 greater than n2 Otherwise, you will get an imaginary answer, which is, of course, unacceptable mathematically. So one of the basic conditions for an optical fiber to have a, cl a cladding material with a refractive index smaller than that of the core material. That's why in this slide, we call this high index core, low index cladding because the core refractive index should be all the time greater than the cladding refractive index. Okay, then we also introduce a very important parameter. Actually, in this, in this chapter, my dear student, you will find a set of 
design parameters and empirical formulas. Because actually, as I mentioned, maybe in lecture number zero, this chapter is more toward an industrial chapter rather than a theoretical chapter. So whenever it comes to industry, we are not wasting our time to make revisions or to make uh, 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 conclusions or to make uh, mathematical der derivatives and, inter and integrations and all this stuff. We have to have a quick design parameters and a quick formulas. One of these design parameters is called delta. And instead of having this long equation, we introduce this delta. Let me show you delta on our white paper. So sine theta A or the numerical aperture, by the way, this is the numerical aperture, not a division. <laughs> okay, a numerical aperture is N1 square minus N2 square. So what if we multiply this under root over two N1 square, and here is N1 square minus N2 square. And then we have another two in the, inside the, 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 the root, and we have N1 at, outside. We call this delta. So the delta is something like some sort of averaging of the refractive indexes. So, for example, when you have two numbers and you, you would like to percentage one with respect to the other. So you substitute them and you divide by the largest one. This is typically what, you, what we are doing. So this is a very important parameter in the optical device, uh, in the optical fiber uh, fabrication. So instead of saying we have N1 is equals to blah, 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 N2 is equals to blah, blah, blah. No, we just need to define two parameters, the delta and N1. Delta represents the relation between the refractive index of the core and the refractive index of the material. And N1, of course, is the refractive index of the core. That's all. So we usually use this abbreviated maybe formula in describing the optical fiber. Back to slides. So as you can see here, it's N1 to delta under root. This is more or less the simplified form. Of course, mathematically wise, both are, both are identical. So this as the basic theory of how optical fiber can craft light inside its core material. Now, let's go to the next step. What is the types or the classifications for an optical fiber? We have basically two types of optical fiber. What we call the step index optical fiber. As I just mentioned, in both cases, the core material should have a refractive index greater than the uh, cladding material. So for the core, for, for the, sorry, for the step index, as you can see, this is the refractive index profile. Basically, the refractive index of the core is greater than the refractive index of the cladding material. So uh, R1, uh, A, sorry, is the uh, radius. As you can see, for R smaller than A, we have the N1, which is greater, while for R greater than or equals to A, we have N2, which is the, the core. This radius can vary, as you can see, and based on the variation of the radius, you can control the number of moves or the number of waves that are propagating inside the optical fiber. So the one in the down of the page is a single mood. While this is a multi-mood, maybe a few uh, slides later on, we will describe in more details what is the difference between the single mood optical fiber and the multi-mood optical fiber. But in both cases, this is a step index optical fiber. Okay, so how we can calculate the number of moods? As I just mentioned, the number of moods is a factor of the radius. So, but not only the radius, by the way. So here we introduce V. By the way, here again, we have a set of empirical formulas. So this formula has no direct definitions. That's why I mentioned DNR or definition is not required. So you don't need to, 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 to memorize this equation. You don't need to memorize the derivation. Here, M equals V squared over A. And as you can see, V is dependent on three very important parameters. 
First, it's dependent on wavelengths, which wavelengths we are, you are working up. And as you can see, it's inversely proportional to the wavelengths. And it's directly proportional to A, which is makes sense. Whenever you have a greater or a larger radius, more waves or more moods can propagate. And it's also directly proportional to the numerical aperture. Whenever you can accept more angles, whenever you can propagate more moods. So this is generally the formula of the V and the M. By the way, maybe one, two slides later on, we will calculate the condition at which M is equals to one. I mean, we have a single mood optical fiber. But this is generally an empirical formula as I mentioned. Okay, perfect. What is the other type of an optical fiber? The other type of an optical fiber is what's called the graded index optical fiber. This is usually my A++ advanced problem in the exams. You can find one, by the way, in your previous unseen exam for uh, academic year 1920. So in this case, it's not a stepped index as we can see here. Here, the change between the core and the clade is instantaneously directly on the border, on the radius, the refractive index changes. However, here, no, you have a graduated change. And this graduated change can have different uh, functions, a linear, parabolic, second, uh, third order, fourth order, or even tenth order. Whenever the order, which is alpha, you can see the order here, this alpha. Whenever the order tends to infinity, you will reach the gray is a step index one. So this is the special condition. When n alpha stands to infinity, graded index stands to the step index one. So as you can see in this, in this formula, we have a constant clading refractive index. Then we have a graded vari variable refractive index inside the material. By the way, let me give you a very small hint. One of the tips I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture is the refractive index is the root, the square root of the permittivity of the, or the relative permittivity. I mean, n equal to root epsilon r. And as you can see here, this is a very special case because here n is function in dimensions. And I mean the refractive index is varying while you are varying the radius of the optical fiber. So at the center, it's maximum. Whenever you go right or left, the refractive index decreases. This is a very special case, what we call the anisotropic materials. Maybe in all your EM1, EM2, microwave antenna, all these modules, you usually deal with what's called isotropic material. I mean, you assume that epsilon and mu, the permittivity and the permeability, are not a function in x, y, and z. Here is a special case. Whenever x, y, and or n mu or epsilon here, epsilon exactly, is a function in space, which is an unisotropic material. This is a hint for your knowledge. Okay, so this is the graded index one. You can see the variation here. And also you can see the propagation of different modes. Again, we have a similar formula where we can calculate the number of modes and V is still the same. Please don't be panicked. You are not requested to memorize all this stuff. This is a place for a data sheet. So this is another formula for the refractive index of, uh, sorry, for the number of moods for the graded one. But before going to the next slide, we have to take care of this very important difference. Please use your memory, your photo memory exactly. What is the difference between this multi-mood structure and this multi-mood structure? Okay, if you have a very good photo memory, you will recognize some differences. First, here light is propagating somehow in straight lines. 
and then it hit the border, which is the radius border between the cleaning and the cool. Total internal reflection occurs and then light return back. Light propagate with different slopes because it is multi-mode, so it has different wavelengths. That's why each one has its own speed. And this is what we call dispersion. And we will talk about it later on while we are considering the dispersion in the optical fiber. However, here light is propagating somehow in a parabolic format. But what is very interesting is that some of these modes have a total internal reflection far from the borders. As you can see, this first one has a total internal reflection on the border. However, this one and this one have a total internal reflection at different points. This is simply because of the graded refractive index. So again, a condition of a total internal reflection is whenever, whenever sun sine phi is equal to n1 over n2. So in the case of a, a step index one, the only point where you have a change in refractive index is the borderline. Otherwise, in this region, the refractive index is constant. So if there is no probability for total internal reflection, total internal reflection can only occur on the borders, no other option. However, herein, in each segment of the core material, you have a new refractive index because it's actually a graded refractive index. So refractive or total internal reflection can occur at different points inside the core material. It can occur basically at the point at which the internal reflection coefficient uh, condition or the critical condition occurs when sine phi is equal to n2 over n1. Phi is constant, n2 is constant, but n1 is variable. So it can occur at different stages in the core material depending on the variation of n1. And of course, the variation of the wavelengths of the input signal because N1 is also the, a, a function in the wavelengths. So this is very, very interesting. And this is somehow some of the different features between having a step index uh, core material, uh, sorry, a step index uh, optical fiber and a core uh, a graded index uh, optical fiber. Okay, finally, in this part, part number one in this lecture, as I mentioned previously, if you set here m equal one, you can determine that the condition at which the single mode occurs. Here, the single mode, of course, is not a function in A or NA because A, which is a radius, this is an optical fiber parameter, and NA is an optical fiber parameter. The main variation is the source, which is the wavelength. So we here define what's called the cutoff wavelength for a uh, single mode optical fiber. This relation, of course, can be easily concluded whenever you sit here m equal one and you get lambda in one side and the others in the other side, then you can reach a relation for lambda c, which you can determine lambda c in terms of a, n1, vc, and also delta. This is very simple like that. And here in vc, which is the dummy variable can vary between 0 and 2.405. Again, this is some sort of empirical data you can use in order to determine the variation in your optical fiber. So this is basically a very easy way where you can study the difference between a single mode optical fiber and uh, multi-mode optical fiber, graded index optical fiber, and oh, sorry, uh, a graded index, yes, and step index optical fiber. This is somehow easy. In the next uh, lecture, or in the next part, actually, I'm sorry, in the next part, my dear students, we are going to demonstrate the impact of optical fiber on a signal. I mean, when you insert a stream of ones and zeros to as an optical fiber, what will happen? We can see that we have two main phenomena. What's called the attenuation phenomena and what's called 
the dispersion phenomenon. So in the next slide, my dear students, we are in the next part, we are going to investigate the attenuation and the dispersion in optical fibers. Thank you very much for your concentration and see you next Thursday. Enjoy.